learn from this and be exhorted by it, and that we might remember and look forward to that day of your son's coming. And in that day, we pray that we might share in the glories of the kingdom. Be with all our ecclesia and help them and care for us, Father, as you always do. We ask this through our Savior, the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> well, I think we, we should be able to conclude uh, Thunder and Lightning tonight. Um, it ends part early. We'll have a social. <laughs> um, so the Lord's judgments with thunder and lightning was this section seven. Um, and we, a lot of people talk about, I'll stay away from you because I'm going to be struck by lightning, you know. And people always say, well, that's an outdated idea. That's not true. What have you. On average, I think in the United States, 2,000 people are struck by lightning per year. Um <laughs> But okay. you know, a, lot, a lot of forest fires, that kind of stuff. So um, Amos says, the Lord roars from Zion and thunders from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherd dry up and the crop, the tops of Carmel wither. So I was just reading today about the whole rebellion from Absalom and the fight that they had. And, and Joab went out to go meet them and all of that. And it says in the text, you know, the trees killed more. Mm -hmm. Than the army, and you're like pretty, and then it's the bickery one after that uh, who rebels after they kill uh, Absalom. Um, but in so many different battles, it'll say, and the storm or the flood or whatever killed more than any army did. So, have you all ever seen the the map of Napoleon's march into Russia? Uh, okay. okay it's it's an incredible map it's well done because it's it shows you the think the strength of his army as a width like a, a ribbon and he crosses a river and it reduces by 20 percent then he crosses another river and it reduces by 20 percent and he goes into russia and by the time he comes back it's a thread so i think he starts off with like two hundred and fifty thousand, and he comes back with ten thousand. and what happened was the weather and they drowned in a river Crossing. Was it cold? Was it cold? In Russia, yeah. Remember the exact time. Oh no, 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 no. It, It's always that's how everybody loses in Russia. Like mm -hmm. uh, Hitler did the exact same thing. He was like, yeah. um, Napoleon, remember what he did? How he lost his whole army? And the exact same thing happened then. So it's like you. That's why it's a joke. And the Princess Bride never had a land war in Russia. Sorry, in uh, in Asia. <laughs> because of how bad it is. So my point is, is that the Lord can use any of his uh, natural disasters to bring this about. So anyway. Mine is not advancing. Why is it not advancing? Is that a blanket behind you? It's showy is. Thank you. <laughs> uh, there's more in the other room. He's in the <laughs> Um. So I'm, I'm looking forward to Rozier telling us anything he remember, remembers about the seven thunders, but they were not written down. So in this one, um, each icon of scripture, more of the pieces of the puzzle come together for the uh, panoramic mosaic, vast in its complexity and rich in contents. We know that the thunder is the voice of the Lord and the lightning, his word, is a blessing or punishment being acting on to accomplish whatever he purposed. So to the righteous... It's a blessing to the wicked. It's always judgment. So in Revelations 10, we have the predictions of what the Apostle John witnessed on the island of Patmos. Yet he was told, do not disclose it or tell anybody. <laughs> so most believers, most believe that the seven thunders will be unfurled during the kingdom age and will be the judgments upon the nations who do not comply with the rule of the Messiah, the king, who rules with a rod of iron from Jerusalem. And that's that picture of a rainbow with one foot on the sea and one stand on shore. Um, and you can see he's got, his face is very bright. He's got the edict and the sword. Uh, this is another, another one. So I'll give this to somebody to read. Okay. Sister Leah, we'll starve you. <laughs> okay. Revelation 10, 1 through 4. Then I saw another mighty angel coming down from heaven, surrounded by a cloud with a rainbow over his head. His face was like the sun, his legs were fiery pillars, 
and he had a little scroll opened in his hand. He put his right foot on the sea, his left foot on the land, and he cried out with a loud voice like a roaring lion. When he cried out, the seven thunders spoke with their voices. And when the seven thunders spoke, I was about to write. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying, seal up what the seven thunders said and do not write it down. So if I remember in, in Revelations, there are, I know there's seven vials, there's seven trumpets, there's seven thunders. Um, and I, I don't know which one comes out after, after seven which. Seven seals so, first. Seven seals yeah. seals is first. <laughs> uh, but this is the very last one. And then we're not told what they are. And then they disappear. So kind of looking back at scripture, you can see how the Lord used thunder as judgments all the way through so far. So I think we can probably conclude there are going to be judgments on the earth. Yeah, well, there's a... I forget where it is and what the story was, where it says that he thundered with a great thunder upon them. I think it's the Philistines, if, yeah. but I'm not. We did and that what is, last week. Is that, is that something literal where he was bringing enormous storms against them? Yeah, it was in, it, I think it was in, in Samuel, actually. Um, in was... Deborah and Barak's battle with the Midianites. Yeah, it or, tells you that God intervened in that battle. With the, uh... Because oh, yeah, he could aim this his white bolts. <laughs> um, Second Samuel twenty-two. Um, Sorry, the smoke of his nostrils consuming fire from his mouth, blazing coals from it. He departed them from the heavens, came down, dark clouds were under his feet, and then he mounted the cherubim and soared on them with his rings. He made darkness as canopy, rain clouds, the sky out of the boldness of his presence. Bolts of lightning blazed forth. He turned thunder from the heavens, and that, that's one incident. And it's also in First Samuel twelve, where he says um, that same day the Lord sent thunder and rain, so all the people stood in awe of Samuel was because they asked for a king. So. And 1 Samuel 7 is when he uses the thunder and lightning against the Philistines. So 7, 12, 22. Three different occasions of the book of Samuel. Yeah, lightning bolt could electrocute a thousand men in a moment. Oh, no. I was standing in wet water. In yeah, I was uh, I was showing there was a article from Scotland or whatever. This lightning bolt came down and killed 500 sheep. One lightning bolt. Mm. That is awful. It just showed all the sheep just laying on the ground because they were killed by it. Mm -hmm. uh, so, can you get a redo for this slide? Brother Roger. All right. Why are, we, why are we told about the seven thunders yet not informed of their meaning or symbology? Perhaps it is because the thunders are the in words of the Lord, and he has already planned future judgments for the earth that we cannot presently comprehend. We need to think about how we will respond to the thunders we have already heard from God over our lifetime and choose life and choose to serve him eternally now. We must realize that we are building an eternal spiritual dwelling now. Are we building in accordance with the thunders of God? For our own way so it'd be really interesting to know what those thunders are i mean i expect they're going to be the things that subjugate the earth so that by the end of them everybody every kingdom will be in compliance with the lord and obviously with christ because he is the king so i think we may be ones carrying out those I, I feel like the saints will be involved in those thunders, whatever they are. Cool. That's part of, wonderful. It's part of the kingdom age that we're not given. But we do know something is going to be revealed to us um, that he has not revealed to anyone yet. Romans 2 is a good reference for that. What about it? Well, I feel like I can read it. Okay. 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 It says, um, but because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath 
when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will re render to each one according to his works, to those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. For God shows no partiality. I was talking about that chapter to somebody else today. Oh, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> about, about, I hate to ask who it was. <laughs> I know, it, was it was about the amended and unamended deal and, and using that, that passage. I was using it because I was like, it seems like it's falling on those who knew God's law and those who did not know God's law. And they are all culpable, you know, in whatever way. So, go ahead, Barry. So, um, a couple of things. How much, the, how much do you think the angels understand of this, of this revelation? Because remember, it only went for, well, it was only given by Jesus to one angel to give it to John. And so, when the angels here are hearing this, how much understanding, you know, or how much debate is going on there amongst the angels? And also, too, the second point, it appears that the angels, um, may stand back from all this and the saints take over, you know, and all this. Yeah. And that's kind of interesting too, that the angels are, uh, they're witnesses, and, but I get the impression maybe they're bystanders to this whole thing. Not that they can't do anything. It's just that the Lord with his bride wants to assert things, not, not the angels. Well, I think they're going to be involved in the resurrection because it's well, yeah, yeah, that part. Place. Yes, so but... they're the harvesters. But it would be interesting, you know, for the saints to be involved in this. And I, I certainly think well, you all are all right about that. Um, well, it says in First Peter uh, one, verse ten through twelve, concerning the salvation, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. But it was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you and the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things into which angels long to look. Mm -hmm. I like that. Can you text both of those to me? The was Romans two was the first one you did, and then that one. I like okay. that. I'm gonna add that in too. Okay. I'm gonna steal it. <laughs> we have a tendency, though, at least from the start, to think that the angels know everything that God knows. Just if you dwell with God, you would know everything. But He has reserved knowledge for Himself and to give it on a need-to-know basis, even to His angels. Just because they're angels and immortal doesn't mean they're all seeing and all knowing and everything that's going on. So and that's why I think it's interesting that Bryce says he's like, I call you no longer servants, but friends, because I've told you everything that the father's told me. Yeah. But he didn't know when the kingdom was going to come either. He just knew the conditions before the kingdom came. What were you gonna say, Jerry? Yeah, so the um and I remember this brother, Roger Lewis okay. um, from Australia, made this point about um, what he called the Council of Angels, which is talked about in different places in the Bible. And that part of our, our training is working in an ecclesia like a council. And so, you know, the Lord calls the angels, and says, well, what do you think we should do here? You know, what do you think we should do there? What would you? And it's interesting that because the angels don't know, but they're, they're trying to add their insight, and they're just trying to learn the mind of God. I mean, I don't think we ever will know this, understand and his I ways. Love, I love the one with Ahab. Who will challenge Ahab to his death, or bring Ahab to his death, and they all say this, that, and the other things, like, I can do it. <laughs> Is that the one about the lying tongue? Yes. Yeah. Says, hey, and and, and the Lord says, great idea. I don't think that's a great idea. Brilliant. Go ahead and do that. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I mean, I just, if you listen to his, I think it was a Bible school talk. His point was that that's what we're training. That's why we get together, have discussions like this. Because later on, we get to have them in a bigger group. Like, okay, what do you, like, you can see the Lord Jesus come maybe. What do you think we should do in a case like this? Yeah. Uh, present a situation. Oh, Lord, you know, of course, the Lord knows, but you say, well, 
he could well, do this. He did do it with his disciples. Uh, the second beating, he was like, so how are we going to get? How, how are we going to feed these people? Yeah. And they're like, we'd be more than a year's wages. What are you talking about? And I think it's Andrew who comes up and says, we got two fish and five loaves of bread. And then he makes it enough. So I, I think that's always exciting. But sure, it, it, it seems like it's not an autocracy, which is what you would expect. You know, somebody who's like, go and do this, go and do that. It's like there's a discussion. And that's amazing. Yeah. You see that in, in Job, too, where he brings the council together. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. That's very. I like that. I have to listen to it. So if somebody that talk, yeah, yeah, you find it. Yeah, I'll find, I'll find the Bible class. He does that. On, yeah. Um, so we're already on the conclusion. Bikes. <laughs> what? <laughs> uh, Barry, you're up next. No, no, it's just your Betty's. Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Many of the acts of God have been hidden from man since the foundation of the earth. Yahweh only reveals Himself little by little. Even now, we are just beginning to understand the complexities. Intricacies. Yeah, it's blurring. Intricacies and majest majesty behind his divine design of everything in the universe. As icons, the beauty of the thunderstorm can be predicted, sorry, appreciated by all of us when we think of thunder as God's voice and lightning as the enacting of his judgments. I, uh, the piece that, that sends shivers down me every time I think about it is when Christ says, my return will be like what? Lightning. Going from the east to the west. And he's like, it's not going to be uh, obfuscated. It's not going to be clodestined. It's not going to be hidden. It's going to be spectacularly revealed. And um <clears throat> I had a couple really good discussions with people about this concerning the Ark. And I know, Jerry, you and I have talked about this. Mm -hmm. That there was power in the Ark and that Uzzah might have died from touching the Ark. Certainly the account in Judges when they opened the Ark. And this is really interesting. I looked back into that again after we talked about it. And <laughs> nobody agrees. So the total count in the Bible, for those who opened the ark and died, uh, maybe from lightning, who knows, because it doesn't really say, is 50,070. And then everybody's like, no, 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 that's too many people. You know, it's too many for that whole area. So let's make it 70 people out of 50,000. And I'm like, mm -hmm. so if you look at your Bible to that passage, it's all over the map. Some versions tell you it's 50,070 and other people say 70,000 out of 500, or sorry, out of 50,000. But either way, it's a huge amount of people who die because they opened the ark of, the, of God. And this plays into the other discussion we had with the um, transfiguration that the three items in the ark, I think, represent the three at the transfiguration. Moses is the law that was in, in there, and the manna represents Christ. He says over and over again to John, I am the real manna that came down from heaven. And then Elijah is the, the blooming and budding uh, almond branch that's in there. That's Aaron's rod that was budded. And I just think it's it's so perfect because you got the, the, the temple that not everybody could go into, the, the outer curtain and then it gets more exclusive just the priests just the levites can go into the actual temple or the tabernacle then only the high priest once a year can go into the holiest of holies like once a year with blood when was the day anybody could open up the ark and look inside zero <laughs> never so my proof for this is is the fact that both of these items were hidden for all of human history. The three items in the ark and the transfiguration, he told them, don't tell anybody until I get crucified. Then after that, or the resurrection, you can, you can tell everybody. So they both get revealed on the same day. The veil and temples were torn in two, and Peter, James, and John are allowed to talk about what happened on the mountain. And to me, 
the reason why those three things be in the ark and why it would stand for the transfiguration is because what? It's Christ glorified. It's him in his kingdom. And I think when he says to the sons of sons of thunder, it's not mine to give to sit at my right and left hand side. It's because of what you see at the transfiguration, who is on his left and his right. You're saying the kingdom. You're saying he was on his right and left. It's Moses and it's Elijah. So pretty amazing when you think about the power of all of this. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't know if it was electrified, certainly. And Raiders of the Lost Ark, they thought it was. <laughs> you know, but that's a, a Jewish director interpreting what he thinks from the Bible and putting it in film. Um, Spielberg. But he certainly, he, he thought this because he's like, Uzzah, you know, got this, and so did these people in uh, Beth Shan was the name of the town. Um, so who's our next reader? Ms. Linda? Psalm 93, 1 through 5. The Lord reigns. He is robed in majesty. The Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength. Indeed, the world is established firm and secure. Your throne was established long ago. You are from all eternity. The seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves. Mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea, the Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. So it is all of nature is at his command. There's nothing on earth or in heaven that is not in his command. He can use the sun, the moon, the stars, the planets, the universe, the clouds, earthquakes, volcanoes, you know, what have you. It's all at his discretion. Um, so it's, it's really interesting to think about how he cloaks himself in majesty and he certainly uses those terms in his discussion with Job at the end of the book um have you have you clothed yourself with majesty and surrounded yourself with the clouds and speak with thunder and lightning so um go ahead Walter the majesty and the glory we see in a thunderstorm belong to the Lord alone man can do nothing to prevent predict or control it that is why I love the icon of lightning and thunder in scripture. For me, it is a time to reflect. The Lord is in his holy temple. Let the earth be silent before him. And that's from Habakkuk 2, 20. And then from Jeremiah 10, 12 through 13. But God made the earth by his power. He founded the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heavens by his understanding. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens roar. He makes clouds rise from the ends of the earth. He sends lightning with the rain and brings out the wind from his storehouses. So a couple things. Uh, the Lord is in his temple of the whole earth be silent before him. That's repeated in several other places. Um, if y'all want to look in your Bibles at Habakkuk 2.20, <clears throat> I think it's in the psalm. I think it's in another place. But to me, the point is God is in his office you know that's what, when, when when my dad was in my office in his office we were like don't bother dad he's in his office you know go ahead there was a um when, when, I, when I was in anesthetist this goes back many years ago when yeah. i was in anesthetist uh we went to a meeting where once you entered the the um assembly room there was to be no speaking and you could talk outside of the meeting but not inside once the music was playing and they used this verse about the Lord is in his holy temple, let everyone keep silent, is that because you were coming to the table of the Lord in the room, everyone should be silent. And it was a really interesting point they were making, and it was exactly like that. You walked in, you didn't say anything. You just sat down and thought. And um, Was it the Temple of Lancaster, Pennsylvania? No, this is up in Canada somewhere. I'm pretty sure it was Canada. And, and I went there, and it was very... I mean, it was new for me because normally meetings you go in, everyone's talking before meeting started. That wasn't you could talk, but it would be outside somewhere talking. Then you came in, that was it. There's gonna be no conversation. So, so you know, I liked it. they cited this. 
I, I love it because I wish we did. You know, we. You know, I guess I really felt like this when Nana died and Dad died. I wanted the world to stop. You know, mm-hmm. I just wanted everything to. I wanted the cars on the highway to just stop. I nope. felt that way. My grandmother died. And and my grandma sinking. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you just want the planes to not take off and <laughs> there to be darkness over the land. Yeah. You know, in morning. Um, but with the Lord, it's a somber respect, like you were saying, mm-hmm. Jerry. Of this is not your moment to say anything. So let's look at the other two references, which is Psalms 11, 4 and Malachi 3, 1. Okay, let's see. We'll have Joanne be next. It's not on the screen, so you got to look it up in your Bible. I'm sorry. It's uh, Psalms 11, 4. Joanne? She'll be looking. I don't know what she's doing. She's looking. Oh. Hope she can hear us. She's still muted. Yeah. I remember, Joanne, you're muted. Yeah. 11, 4. Yeah, uh, Psalms 11, 4. Okay. For the chief musician on stringed instruments, a psalm by David, answer me when I call. God of my righteousness, give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. You sons of men, how long shall my glory be turned into dishonor? Will you love vanity and go seeking after falsehood? But know that Yahweh has set apart for himself him who is godly. Yahweh will hear when I call to him. Be angry and don't sin. Search your own heart on your bed and be still offer the sacrifices of righteousness put your trust in Yahweh many say who Mm. will show us any good Yahweh let the light of your face shine on us you have that's fine I I think that's the wrong reference it was just one verse it was um so I thought it was Psalms eleven four. I have it written in my Bible, but I guess that's not Psalm. That's, that's, it. that's it. Okay, I apologize. Let's go to Zephaniah one seven. And I apologize, guys. I thought that was right reference. So we better check that other one too. Is it my turn, Walter? Yes, ma'am. Zephaniah one seven. Hold thy peace at the presence of the Lord, for the day of the Lord is at hand. For the Lord hath prepared a sacrifice. He hath, oh dear. He hath (laughs) been his guest. Should I go on? You can see that's about the day of the Lord as well. And um, Joanne, would you be willing to read the other one, which is Zechariah, God willing, 2.13? And I apologize. I thought I had that one correct. It was correct. So She didn't read the right book. She wasn't in the right book yeah. or verse or chapter or whatever. Okay. She probably didn't hear the right. So yeah. you have, you have Psalms so- 11.4 then? Psalms 11.4? I have to go back to it. I can. Thank you. Do you want me to read Zechariah 2 13? Yes. Be silent, all flesh, before Yahweh, for he has roused himself from his holy habitation. That's excellent. Yep. They they all say this, and it it implies, I think, awe and humility. You know, mm-hmm. that you're respectful of the Lord being in his temple. And I just I love it. It gives me a sense of peace. It's like the Lord is in his temple, let the earth be silent. Yay. <laughs> and, and again, that's what that ecclesia was getting at is that when we come for the table of the Lord, that's part of, of a temple service, so to speak. Mm-hmm. A little a little bit to your point about the most likely place being representation of Christ and that we're in the presence of that. So we shouldn't be talking you know here there and whatever 
Mm -hmm. and, and this gets back to a basic element, you know, Christ did not allow the temple to become a money bank exchange. He didn't want the animals being bought and sold and exchanged in his mm -hmm. temple. And we we see those elements creeping into the Jewish culture over and over again. Nehemiah said, shut the doors mm -hmm. to the city and don't stand in front of it. This is closed on the Sabbath. Do not come near the gate right. again. I will tear up on your hair and your beard. <laughs> you <go. laughs> I said, yeah. I, I mean, even in a Southern Baptist church, it was like that. I mean, there'd be a few kids who, you know, didn't get the memo, so to speak. Everyone's going to whisper something. But when you, you heard the bell ring, you know how bells are, and you come in, you take your seat, and that's where you sat, and you were quiet. And, and then the organ and the pianos would play and do their thing. And service began. We were not making tons and tons of noises because we had that same idea that mm -hmm. this is God's house, how we always refer to it as. Mm -hmm. So we were quiet. It's like Ecclesiastes 5. Go ahead. Uh, it says, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God. For God is in heaven, and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. Can you send them one to me? I like that. <laughs> Did you want me to read this one? Oh, yes, please. Oh, okay. <laughs> Psalms 11, 4. Adonai is in his holy temple. Adonai, his throne is in heaven. Uh, his eyes see and test humankind. I love it. So what I think this kind of all rolls back to is the first real incident where everybody sees the presence of the Lord for the first time as the Jews, okay? So what event would you say that was where they saw the terror of the Lord with thunder and lightning? Mount Sinai. Yes, Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai. Yeah. So in that event, how would the people have reacted? Well, we they were bringing their coffee. Oh, yeah. Hey, buddy, what's going on? How's the desert on your side? No, and that, they wouldn't have been doing anything. But even Moses said, I quake and tremble. Mm -hmm. And Moses, who had spoken with the Lord, he's saying, I was very scared. Imagine the rest of the people are like, mm -hmm. oh, we don't know what to, we're terrified what's going on. Yeah. They really were. Right? So I think that almost is the emulation of that phrase let the world be silent. Yeah. The Lord is in his temple. You see that on Mount Sinai. I doubt anybody was chit chatting at the bottom of the mountain. You know, they were silent before him because of his greatness. And the thunder and lightning really brings that to bear. Yeah. And you you see that with children the first time they experience a thunderstorm. Mm -hmm. What what give me some typical responses? Yeah. To jump in the bed with mom and dad. Or under the bed. Uh, yeah. 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 They come running there, there too. When they were three and four years old, boy, they came flying in the bedroom at night. It could have been 2 a.m. and they were scared to death. Well, Deborah said um, in Judges 4, Lord, when you went out in Seir, when you marched from the region of Edom, the earth trembled and the heavens dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked before the Lord, even Sinai before the Lord, the God of Israel. That's good. You got to send me that one too. <laughs> You'll be busy at night. <laughs> Those are all really good passages. <laughs> so, Walter, yes. I mean, it always came to my mind that when you come into the house, you want to be silent and quiet because you come for instruction and direction. And how can you receive instruction and direction if you're making too much noise? You can't hear, if you will, the voice of what God wants to teach you. So when you come in in a quiet, peaceful way and sit, then the very words you hear next, we presume, are God speaking to us through either exhortation, whatever's going on. So that's what he wants you to hear today. So unless you're quiet, you're not going to hear any of this properly. So bring this up partially because I, I just have been seeing things happening in, in different ecclesias. I'm not going to cast aspersions or judgments or anything. But what you, you you're seeing, I think, everywhere is the lack of formality, the lack of reverence. Mm -hmm. People rolling in however they want, 
you know, they might as well come in a sleeping bag. Uh, they just haven't got it together. And it's not about pomp and circumstance. It's about respect. And I would put it right back to Malachi where he says, I wish somebody had a good sense to just close the doors to my house. Do not come in to my temple with these terrible offerings. I don't want them. They're stench to me. Keep them away. Uh, he's like, you think this is good? Go take it to your governor. Let's see what they would think. So I, I take my cue from that. If you were going to go meet the governor, would you be like in a Bermuda shirt, shorts, and flip flops? Mm -hmm. I, don't, I, don't, I don't think so. I think if you were invited to dinner at the governor's house, you would dress for the occasion. Respectfully. You dress respectfully. And the other thing that's happening with this rollback of any kind of formality, oh, ties are important. No, you don't have to look nice. You don't have to do da, 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 da. Is we're opening it up to the world. We're just saying, the world, us, let's 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 shorten that gap and make it as close as possible. The third thing I see is people want to express their own opinions voraciously over God. So, you know, even in the Sunday school realm, it's like, do we want instruction from the Lord? We can still have a discussion, or do we just want to have a discussion-based class so that we can all express our opinions? And in some ecclesias, it has turned into a talk show. You know, it's turned into the Oprah Winfrey show. It's turned into, what was the guy who was so terrible? Uh, Dr. Phil? No, below <laughs> that. The one where there was always fights on it. Uh, oh, George uh, Springer? Yeah. yeah. Jerry Springer. Yeah. Somebody like a Jerry. Yeah. <laughs> but don't pick on Jerry. Not his fault. But it's just like, you know, are we keeping God's standard until he comes? Are we like, well, let's do this concession, that concession, this concession, that concession. And pretty soon you're indistinguishable from the world. That's the only point I'm making about it is that with all this lessening of holiness, with all this lessening of awe, with taking God and saying, you're my buddy, you're my best friend. Um, it's frightening to me because I'm like, we owe him all. We owe him respect. We owe him the formality at our best at all times. Mm -hmm. That was the failure right after the garden. They didn't bring their best. And Abel did and Cain did not. And he killed his brother because he hated him that much. And in the brotherhood, I think we can expect the same thing. If you want to bring your best, they're going to hate you. They're going to want to kill you just like Cain did. What, my offering is not good enough? And I'm like, no, it's not. And we're trying to save you from destruction. Don't dress like it doesn't matter. Don't come in late. Don't turn Sunday school into a talk show. We are to observe Habakkuk 2.20 and Psalms 11.4 and Zechariah 2.8 and Zephaniah 1.7. We're standing before the awe-inspiring God of the universe, not your next-door neighbor, not your friend, not a family member, not a buddy. And to me, it's just frightening because in my lifetime, I've seen it switch <clears throat> from very respectful. And I'm not saying it has to be rigid or cold or mean. It's just respectful to God will take whatever I give. That's kind of the attitude I know. You know, I showed up. He should be jubilant. I showed up. <laughs> I may have showed up at 11.05, you know, during the meeting, but I showed up. So God should be thrilled when I'm here. And I'm like, really? Read Malachi 1 and see if that should be your attitude. Mm -hmm. So go ahead. And this, what you're saying reminds me when, when there was a great storm on the sea and Jesus came. No, he was sleeping in the boat. Yes. And they're bailing water, which in itself, Jesus is not awake, even though they're bailing water. It's a pretty bad storm. Yeah. And, and they say, you know, don't you care that we're going to die, which is not <laughs> say yeah. what. You right. don't care that he doesn't care. And then he stands yeah. up and, and he silences everything. And they didn't ask him a question. They were afraid of him. They didn't ask a question. Like, they said, how did he do that? Who is this? What manner of you know? Man. They yeah. silenced the the wind, the winds, the way everything stopped. Everything, everything. Stopped. Nature obeys them. Yeah, and they were afraid. It says they were afraid. 
they don't want to ask him anything. And Jerry, that it's a perfectly reverse. Yeah, yeah. It's like world. Yeah, I don't want to talk. You know, it's interesting about Jesus because a lot of the disciples. I think he was so humble that, uh, like Martha, when she said, Lord, don't you care that my sister's not helping me with any of this, you know, attending to the guests and everything, you know? And then uh, when Lazarus was uh, in the tomb and she said, well, Lord, you know, by now there's going to be a stench. You know, like she was telling him something he didn't know, right? <laughs> <laughs> I love Captain Obvious. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but um, I think many times um, people just, it's funny because I thought about this a little bit and um, the proud, they always have to put themselves out there, you know, bow, bow, bow up their chests and tell everybody how much they know about everything so that they'll have respect. But I doubt that Jesus did that. He acted just like a common that everybody was just like, well, maybe he can't, you know, maybe he is just like me. You know, <laughs> but that's the other verse. You thought I was just like you. Was that in the Psalms? Or, now I will confront you to your face. Yeah, he says, God, God saying it. And he said, yeah. You thought I was just like you. Mm -hmm. It's talking about the wicked who yeah. um, take, he take his them? name on their lips, oh, uh, but they don't that. obey his commandments. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Put that okay. in here. I think so, you have Sister Fonda sitting by to read oh, something for I'm them. I'm sorry, Fonda. Go right ahead. I apologize. Oh. <laughs> oh you already. What one? I forgot. What did we yeah. do? <laughs> what you wanted her to read? No, so it was. Uh, <laughs> was she doing you, you read the Zephaniah 1 7, right? Or no? I think I did, but I don't remember <laughs> more. Zechariah 2 thir 13. Zechariah 2 13. Yeah. Be silent, O flesh, before the Lord, for he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Yeah, I like the way that says it. That's very southern. He is risen up out of his holy habitation. That's good. <laughs> um, the other one is in Malachi 3 1. I have. I can read that too. 3 1. Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom ye seek shall suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant whom ye delight in. Behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. I love us. Boy, that is beautiful. That adds a lot more to it. And Malachi is my favorite book. Oh, so us. Love it. Wash us. But you just can't wait for it to go. It's like rain in, the, in our desert. Is the aspect of really knowing and feeling this in verse 13. When he thunders, the waters in the heavens roar, and he makes the cloud rise from the ends of the earth. So having sailed in the Bahamas, we had a big storm the last night, and it was lightning was all over the place. Yeah. The water echoes the thunder yeah. and it's just crazy i mean it's like you know it just keeps going and going and going and i didn't realize because i grew up in the mountains you know but uh, it echoes in the mountains too but uh it was very different mm -hmm. off the ocean to see it like that mm -hmm. um so who had another reading somebody else you had your reading next again fonda or did we already read them all right I can read that Psalm okay. 50. Yeah. What if you, want. You, you read Malachi. I think that was the last one. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Thank you so much, Fonda. Um, let's see. Uh, Psalm 50, verse 16. But to the wicked, God says, What right have you to recite my statutes or take my covenant on your lips? For you hate discipline, and you cast my words behind you. If you see a thief, you're pleased with him and you keep company with adulterers. You give your mouth free reign for evil, and your tongue frames deceit. You sit and speak against your brother. You slander your own mother's son. These things you have done, and I have been silent. You thought that I was one like yourself, 
And now I will rebuke you and lay the charge before you. Mark this then, you who forget God, lest I tear you apart and there be none to deliver. The one who offers thanksgiving as his sacrifice glorifies me. To one who orders his way rightly, I will show the salvation of God. That's beautiful. So that's Psalm 50. What verses did you read? Uh, I sent it to you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> I just love it because in one, one version it says, you thought I was just like you. Yeah. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's how we treat God. We think that God is on our level and that he's our friend and, you know, we can... And I, I don't, I understand the dialogue and prayer that you have with him reverently in your own home, but give him the honor he's due is very evident from this thunder and lightning and all the occasions in which it occurs. Given to the Lord, the honor due his name, worship him in the beauty of holiness. And I can't remember the verses from, I know it was one of Harry Wecker's most favorite verses. That's a hymn too. Oh, yeah. the, the beauty of holiness yeah. is the temple. Look it up. All right. Well, for impromptu. Who's our next reader? Bon, is Mike with you tonight? Yes, he is. If he will read for us, please. Yes, what is he reading? The slide. The screen. <laughs> okay, just want to make sure. Yeah, no, it's good. Excellent. I love, I can, I can see Mike painting this picture because I like the dark umber of the grass and then the purple hues and the clouds and the mountains. I was like, oh, what a majestic picture. I think it might be out west or Australia. I think it's South Africa. The voice of the It's a real but, picture? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But what about the mountains? I don't know. Which translation? I guess, yeah. Oh, no, no, that would be appropriate. I think it's bottom where it came from. Okay. Are you ready? Yep. <clears throat> Despite all the hubris of man, thunder and lightning still reign supreme. Missions to space cannot launch in the presence of thunder or lightning. And there is still no way for man to predict exactly where lightning will strike or why. Those attributes belong to the divine being of the universe, and we are not holy enough nor divine enough to know. This is affirmed in the Lord's speech to Job and is still true for us today. Yeah, it's like, it's very, very hard for people to even indicate like when you look on your weather app like we're we're so much more advanced in society than anybody else was ever you know forecasting of weather didn't even come about until very recently within the last hundred years um so th there's these apps that can show you here's the lightning strikes in your area and it will show you like the gps right. of the lightning it's like this is crazy i don't know how they even do that but um the predictability of what God could do with his weather has never been able to be completely determined. So this is a little sidelight. Um, there's a really good book that's by Eric Lawson and it's called um, Isaac's Storm. Isaac was a meteorologist in Galveston, Texas in 1900. Oh. And he worked for the weather service and he said, we have advanced as far in meteorology as man will ever go. You know, we know what's going on. Ebola. He convinced the town council of Galveston, very wealthy city, very elegant city, not to build a seawall. You're not going to need it. No hurricane will ever hit you. So they didn't build it. Okay. You've been to Galveston. It's like the Ellis Island of the South huge port city like people from europe people from central and south america all came to galveston it was it was a big city anyway so he basically said there'll never be a hurricane that was the worst natural disaster in american history still nobody's count covered it it was over sixteen thousand dead okay so they hated this one guy who worked for the weather service and they banished him to havana cuba he sent him a telegram, 
we just experienced a Cat 4 hurricane. You better prepare. It's coming to you. Not that they used those terms back then. Right. Mm -hmm. So it swept over Galveston, hit them with this, you know, the surge swell plus yeah. the wind, wiped out 20 city blocks all the way through. Yeah. Just took it off the foundations. Then it turned into a tornado and came back and swept everybody out to sea. Wow. 16,000 dead. That book really captures what's going on. Your your thing is doing something. Oh no, really? But well, we're almost done. But I, just, I got fifteen minutes. Or... I would I would recommend. <laughs> I, I would recommend it. It's called Isaac Storm. And the reason the reason the reason why it's effective is it just shows you man will never know the be able to predict anything. But it's still the largest natural disaster in America. Did he say why he didn't think a hurricane would ever hit Columbus Cruise? He thought they were protected because of how far west they were um, in the Gulf. And typically the storms came through Florida and they came up through um, Mount Joseph. Yeah, up through the Appalachians and up the coast. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but they, they, he didn't think they would survive that far west. Yeah, And I mean, it took down one of the most opulent cities. It was like the Savannah or Cape May, New Jersey or whatever. It was beautiful. I mean, and it just mm -hmm. killed all these people, yes. So what you said earlier reminded me of uh, Brother Whitaker's book about Reformation. I don't know if you mm -hmm. ever read that. But he makes a couple of points here, idea of casualness that we do. One is, why in prayer do we quote what God has already written? Like, yeah. does he not know? What are you already, like? It's like me coming to you and quoting what you said. Like, you already know that. Why am I? Why are you telling me that? The other one he went after was, um, and th this I don't. I have not heard it very much recently. Where people close a prayer by saying, "Through our elder brother, right. Lord Jesus." He thought that was too common. In other words, you were trying to bring Jesus down to our level of like uh, like a brother or something, as opposed to elevating him higher. When he said "elder brother." Yeah. And he didn't like that phrase a whole lot. And I thought, again, it's all part of reverence and all part of knowing your your where you your boundaries, where you who you are in relation to who you're talking to. Absolutely. Hey, regarding the weather, does anybody re here remember uh, the guy Reuben, <clears throat> who used to predict the weather here in Richmond? Oh, is he a, a meteorologist in Richmond? No, he wasn't a meteorologist. The uh, but. I guess nobody's old enough to, to remember him, but uh, this was back in the uh, '60s, and and um, he predicted the weather so accurately he he would predict it a year out, and and he was right. And um, here's the tomorrow's almanac. Well, he like that. he lived in my neighborhood, and um, his whole backyard was completely full of device, you know, like scientific devices and meteorological things. It was a hobby. But even the uh, weathermen on the, you know, television stations would, um, you know, give their prediction. And then they would say, and Ruben says, you know, <laughs> and because he was always accurate. But Yeah, that would be nice if we had somebody who was still around. Yes, we've got yeah. no accurate. He was uncanny. I don't know how he, I, you know, I don't know if anybody knew how he did it, but um, like I said, he was accurate a year out. He would predict weather. Man, yeah, I when I was going to D.C. for 17 years, I used to pick up this guy. He worked for NOAA, and he did he did um, tornado modeling, mm -hmm. and his models were more correct than almost anybody else at NOAA. And I asked him why, and he says, "I'll tell you because you don't work for us." He says it's because I always use brown temperature as well as atmospheric temperatures because it's like having half of the solution, you know, or half of the staff of raw. You don't know the rest of it. And, you know, it it depends on the difference in the temperatures in order for that suction tube to get started, the funnel to get started. Now, that thought was really interesting, and he explained more to me, but I was sworn I'd get killed by totally anybody. So. Yes, Walter. Now that's so, been recorded. Yeah, no, I'm not very long to rest. So add to your list of all of the uh, scriptures you've been doing. You know, I quoted partly for you about, um, you know, worship the Lord and beat of holiness. That's Psalm 29, whose title is the voice of the Lord in the storm. 
And if you read this 29th Psalm, oh. it's all about, I'll, I'll just do a couple of things. It's copy the text to me after yeah. you read it. He says, ascribe to the Lord, O sons of the mighty, ascribe to the Lord God and strength, glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Worship the Lord in the holy array. The voice of the Lord is upon the waters. The glory of God thunders. The Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. The voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord breaks in pieces the cedars of Lebanon. He makes Lebanon skip like a calf and goes on and on. Because go, go. we get finish. Okay. But on, on your point, did they mention about the Farmer's Almanac, which has been around for a couple of hundred years? It tries, it, it does fairly well predicting because based on the seasons and you know, things. I don't know how, to, I don't really don't know how. It didn't it Ben, Fra didn't ben well. Franklin? <laughs> <laughs> we had a torrential downpour on this the wedding. This is supposed to be sunny on my wedding. <laughs> it was mostly indoors. Oh, uh, yeah, it was all right. I think it was hot. But, but I think the, the <laughs> almanac was supposed to be based on... Well, you didn't care about the farms. I don't know, something about with the atmosphere and the winds. And, and it was, I, I think it was Franklin that started it, Ben yeah. Franklin. Yeah. But And even now it's used. The oh, it totally is. almanac it tends to be... Well, it's not perfect, but it tends to be better than what you And you Benjamin see. Franklin was the one who came up with the lightning rod to save Philadelphia yeah. houses. And he attached that to buildings to transfer the electric current to the ground so it wouldn't destroy yeah. your house. Um, it's interesting because it's come back, it's come in and out of vogue. You know, scientifically, as to whether it actually causes the lightning to strike your house. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Whether you shouldn't have one or what. Um, okay. Uh, good. Our next reader is. Okay, let's see. Ah, Sister Nancy and Brother David. Okay. Lastly, the thunder also served as an affirmation of Christ at his crucifixion. In John 12, Christ told his disciples that he was greatly troubled, and though perplexed, he was there to do the Lord's will. Words appeared like thunder to the crowd, however. Yes, yeah, so I think that's recorded in just one of the Gospels, that there was thunder at we have the earthquake, we have the darkness, but there was also thunder. Um, backwards, okay. <laughs> okay, so can I have a reader for John 12? Brother David. Now Thank my you. soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. Thank you, David. That's great. And then in this, he, Jesus says this about it. He says, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. And so what was it? Um, it was, Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it and will glorify it again. That little phrase was heard as thunder by some and others thought it was an angel. Again, we've said before, lightning seems like two different things to two groups of people. To the wicked, it's judgment. To the righteous, it is refreshing. It's the glory of God. It is everything we've been hoping for. Um, 
and it will be to us when Christ returns and puts everything back in order and justice is maintained in the earth and inequity and man's hubris is humble. It'll be like, be like sitting under a waterfall. Yes. So when you're thundering and lightning, everyone sees the light, but few hear the words and the thunder of its truth. That's good. That's very good. So they, everybody, you're right. They all see the light. See, even if the wicked, they see the lightning, they see the light. But when the voice is there, they don't hear it. They don't hearken to it. It's just noise to them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So there's a lot here because the Lord invented this. You know, it's his icon. It doesn't belong to anybody else. Uh, people certainly borrow it for everything else. Um, but his thunder is is his power. It's not ours. Um and that is the end of it all. So thank you all so much. And uh, um, appreciate your all's the time and attention and comments have been phenomenal tonight. Um, is there anybody we should knowingly pray for or things going on? I haven't heard an update on Joe Boma. I talked to Holly Billingsley today. Yeah, Holly. Uh, Lou Abbott's wife. Oh, okay. Do you have an address for us to send a letter? I don't have an address. I have her phone number. Okay, but you could you could get it and send it to us. So yeah, letter. I can do that. Yeah. Okay, so what should you say? Tim would have it too. Uh, oh, by the way, Tim said to give his love to everybody. I called him. Well, he called me right before Bible class, and he's in Canada. Yeah. Um. So she just was calling me because she's been uh, donating to the UCA. Uh, Lou was doing donating to the UCA, and she needed to you know stop the payments and everything. Um. But she was said that you know she was uh so devastated um that she was thinking of all the wonderful things about him but at the same time just missing him so much and and just walking around from room to room in the house just remembering everything about him and um she was just so sweet you know but she said she wants to come back to the chapel and visit soon yeah. But if we could just keep her in our prayers, sure. you know. That'd be great. And yeah. also, if we could keep, um, we, we had one of the um, UCA contacts contact us again. We had met with um, several times um, last year and even before that. And uh, we hadn't seen him for about six, six months. months. And he contacted Roger and wants to meet on Saturday. So if we could pray about that, that would be great. Wow. Well, good. It's, it, he's not needing bad help, though. Mm -mm. Oh, okay. I just wants to talk about the scriptures. And help him come out of. Yeah, I'm just looking to write some letters, so I was just wanted to see if there's anybody else I needed to write to, but we can certainly pray about this at the end. Um, Walter, are you okay with doing a closing prayer? Sure. All okay, right, just let me ask. So, is there anything else anybody needs to have prayed for? Fonda, um, Bostonians? No, no, no. Joanne, I could, I mean, Betty and Ed. All right, two minutes. Oh, go ahead. Okay. My dear, kind and merciful Heavenly Father, once again, we thank thee for the privilege of approaching thy throne of truth and mercy and grace. And thank you for the many blessings of light that you bestow upon us, especially that great word of truth that guides and directs us and show us your path. We long for the coming of thy son and pray you may send him soon that all these terrible things might be put away and the world can be changed and be what you'd have it to be. We pray you be those who suffer through trial and tribulation, through poor health, that you might help them in guiding and direct them. Our friends, such as Holly, you might help her and those who are reaching out to find out about your word and have such a desire to learn it. Guide and direct those and those who meet with them that they might have a great and positive experience. We thank you for these many days and all this that you've done for us. Thank you for the blessing of life and pray for these things in and through the name of thy son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Give that one minute. Thank you, Brother Joe. You're yeah, welcome. Thank, you. thank, thank you, you, Walter. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.